tissue culture and plant transformation. Basically, tissue culture is useful to plant breeders for two general reasons. Breeders can use tissue culture to, to select superior plants or to expand the plant gene pools. We'll talk about uh, very briefly each of these topics. Micropropagation, basically just cloning plants from cellular or callous material. Dihaploids, primarily using anthocultures to culture haploid materials and double them back to diploids. Then screening of cells in cultures and nutrient media rather than screening plants in the field. Expanding the gene pool, selection of somaclonal variation, which has resulted in some very useful new varieties. Embryo rescue, probably the, the most broadly used tissue culture technology in expanding gene pools because it allows wide genetic crosses and sort of approaches the, the uh, genetic cap transfer capability of transformation. Somatic hybridization, basically development of protoplast and fusing protoplast to get hybrids. And then, uh, of course, tissue culture is essential for plant genetic transformation. By micropropagation, you can start with any of several explants from the, the plant tissue shoot tips, you can use uh, leaf tissues, you can use stem tissues, you can use root tips. Basically, you just propagate thousands of these little plantlets and its uses are primarily to eliminate viruses from vegetatively propagated plants, either through mare stem culture or by heat treating callus cultures. It's now used in over 60 crops, and it's used extensively in potatoes and cassava. These are viruses that are transmitted through seed, but you can eliminate the viruses. I'm sorry, they're not transmitted by seed, but the, the crops are vegetatively propagated. So once you get a virus in your tomato or cassava strain, it's always propagated with the cuttings uh, in the farm. So. Labs are set up now all over the world. There, there are large laboratories in Africa today that are producing uh, cassava and some potatoes that are virus-free. You can also use it to maintain heterozygous populations for marker development. Any, anytime you need to clone a lot of individual copies of a plant. Yeah? You, you, so in completely sterile conditions. And so the virus is not really in the, the newly dividing meristem tissue. So you start out with a clean source of the plant that doesn't have any virus in it and maintain it. Or if you really can't do meristem cultures with your, your crop, you can take callus cultures and you can heat treat them and kill the virus within the callus cultures and then go through forward with a, a virus-free strain. So maintaining populations, uh, particularly useful if you're doing F2 populations for uh, older molecular marker type study. You can produce inbred plants. Uh, there have been schemes where using genic male sterility, where if you go through the normal sexual cycle, 50% of your plants are always fertile. Well, you could take the sterile portion or the ones with little limbs, male sterile, little male sterile, and you could uh, increase those using micropropagation in order to produce a pure sterile female plant for hybrid production. Again, the cost associated with the micropropagation makes that not economical unless the seed that you're producing is a very, very high-priced vegetable seed. And uh, actually, micropropagation and other techniques are used in germplasm preservation. There's a lot of work being done now to store gene banks under either cold conditions where there's slow growth or to cryopreserve callus cultures of different selection and accessions of germplasm. Breeding with dihaploids often uses anthroculture. 
basically you can save at least three to four generations because you go from an F1 to anthroculture to double the chromosomes to get to a fully homozygous individual in essentially two generations, F1 through culture to chromosome doubling and you jump all the way up to F6. And so in self-pollinated crops such as wheat or rice where you cross two different individuals, get to F1 hybrid, but you want to get back to homozygous pure line varieties as fast as possible, this works. Again, the cost of doing the, the anthroculture and producing the diaploids must be weighed in to the value of the varieties and to the savings that you might accrue from not having to go through two or three years of selections through normal uh, generations. Once you get down to the F6, you still need to go through the normal variety yield trial selection and testing to get to a new cultivar. Selection of cells rather than, than tissues. We pointed out that uh, if, if you're dealing with traits controlled or inbred parents that, that differ by 10 genes, that in order to look at all of the various different types of genetic segregants in an F2 population, you'd have to look at five or six million plants. You can't do that. We don't have the facilities to go out millions of plants in F2 generations to look at. If you can take those individuals, put them in a callus or suspension culture, basically you can have rooms full of dishes or vats containing cali from different individuals, dump in a chemical, in this case it's lanate insect or herbicide in corn, and only the resistant individuals will develop and survive. This in vitro selection has been used extensively to select for herbicide resistance. The herbicide resistant traits that are being sold today that were not created through genetic transformation were all selected for herbicide resistance, lanate of course being one. Uh, you can select for disease resistance, in cases where the pathogen that you're dealing with produces a toxin, and it's the toxin from the pathogen that kills the host cells, you can select for disease-resistant uh, variants. Lisa Earl and I did a lot of selection for southern corn leaf blight resistance because the pathogen that causes that disease produces a toxin, which is responsible for killing the cells. Selections for abiotic stress tolerance, again, it's difficult to change the culture conditions to get the stresses, but if you can put in materials that create high os osmoticum or salt stress within your media, you can select for materials that uh, are uh, tolerant to salts. You can certainly select for materials tolerance to heavy metal ions. Selection for increased yields of secondary metabolites. I won't say a lot about, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. All you do is the 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 uh, rationale is you dump aluminum into your callus cultures, and anything that can grow on aluminum in the culture at least has a chance to grow under aluminum high aluminum fields. Often they don't do that, and in fact, a lot of the work that's selected in culture, once you regenerate those plants, take them to the field, you don't see the full levels of tolerance or resistance, but the same is true for transgenic plants for this trait. So a lot of the transgenic plants that are developed that look very, very good in growth chambers and greenhouses, once we take them to the field, they don't look so good because of all of the other environmental variables that, that impact the expression of that trait. Secondary metabolites is a big, big usage of tissue culture. It's not necessarily a plant breeding application, but there are a lot of uses of fermentation technology to take either plant tissues or bacterial or, or yeast 
or other microorganisms, grow these in large, large fermentation vats to produce any number of, of products for polymers or for uh, fuels or for whatever reasons. There are also a number of, of uh, products that are nutrients or anti-nutrients or antioxidants that are uh, developed as secondary metabolites. All right, somoclonal breeding procedures. We're moving from tissue culture techniques that allow you just to select and increase desirable plants that, that you might want to, uh, can, to use to techniques that actually bring more genetic variation, allow you to create genetic variation. Somoclonal uh, breeding basically relies on the fact that uh, in tissue cultures, particularly callus cultures that are maintained for periods of weeks or months, there are natural mutations or changes that occur a small percentage of those changes will turn out to be desirable. Most of those changes will be lethal or deleterious, but a small percentage are desirable. But basically, you can work with such large numbers of cells that you can identify one desirable mutant out of several million that, uh, cells that you look at. So the idea is select singles to target single cells usually use a suspension culture, so the cells are sort of floating individually or in small clumps in suspension. You have the option of applying mutagens, and, and so our whole mutation breeding strategies are, are sort of uh, being reworked by applying various mutagens into suspension cultures, uh, and you use a selection pressure that will give a very high kill rate. So if you were screening for aluminum tolerance, you would put in lots of aluminum. You'd want to kill just about every cell in your suspension culture and only select a few individuals that survive. And then the key is to regenerate whole plants from those individuals that survive and hope that those whole plants show some level of the tolerance to the chemical or to the uh, environmental treatment or, or factor that you've introduced into the media. Uh, I should point out, uh, I didn't, I must have thrown the slide out, but there are a number of varieties that have been developed and released today for resistance to diseases, for herbicide tolerance, for very other, other factors that were the result of somoclonal variation. And a lot of people are studying, well, what are the real mechanisms of that? Uh, basically, it, it's just natural mutation, and rates of mutation seem to be elevated somewhat when you take the cells out of a plant structure and put them in an in a undifferentiated mass of callus. Embryo culture applications are probably the most extensively used in plant breeding. Uh, in that we rescue embryos from wide crosses. Uh, a lot of, of, I'll show you a slide in a minute, a, a lot of the relatives of our plants will not, of our crop plants, are not sexually compatible. But in a lot of cases you can make a cross and you can get an embryo. It's just that the embryo aborts. It will not grow and develop in the plant tissue. So by cutting out that embryo, excising it, putting on proper media, you can result in developing plants from those wide crosses. It's used to overcome seed dormancy. You can take a series of embryos of plants that just will not grow because they've gone dormant. You sometimes apply gibberellic acid as a hormone and you can break dormancy very readily and very efficiently. In a lot of the uh, tree crops, you can speed up life cycles. Uh, in fact, even in the, the days when we were trying to run lots of generations of back crossing of maize to get PT, BT genes in, we used embryo culture basically to speed up the germination of maize back cross individuals. So that basically you don't have to wait, you can go in to a uh, pollinated flower 14 days in maize after 
the, the pollination's been made, you can harvest the immature embryo, throw it in media and develop a little plantlet that you can regenerate back to a new plant, transplant to the field, and save yourself a matter of a month or six weeks of time waiting for that uh, embryo to go through maturity and produce a seed on the plant. An area that, that uh, has been developed commercially and it does work commercially, particularly in some other vegetable seed, it is really just developing artificial, artificial seed. You can take somatic embryos, you can produce large, large quantities of embryos, and you can either sell them directly as propagules to be planted and little plants grow up, or more often you coat them with sort of an artificial seed coat, which acts like the normal seed coat and provides some nutrients and maybe even some herbicide or, or a fungicide to kill pathogens and weeds in the soil that might compete. Yeah. Well, you you take the little embryo and you coat it with an artificial seed coat to sort of make it an artificial embryo. Otherwise, you take the little embryos and put them out there uncoated. And, and those are sort of, I guess, normal embryos. So you're making an artificial seed, really, by taking those embryos that you're culturing and putting a little coat on them so they look like little seeds. Uh, if you're interested, Lisa Earle, in her plant reading 401 class, covers all of these topics and technologies and does an entire lecture on embryo rescue and development of artificial seed. So just as, uh, and this is from Lisa actually, just to show the applications and expanding the gene pool, normally in tomato, there are a number of lycopersican species that are sexually compatible. And so without tissue culture, you can make crosses within this range. By utilizing tissue culture, hybrids via embryo culture and other methods, you can extend it to some others, including the, uh, the uh, uh, solanaceous plants. And if you use somatic hybridization, or protoplast fusions, you can even go out and produce broader based hybrids. So the concept of bringing genes from sort of distantly related organisms into plants certainly didn't originate with our plant transformation technology. And ironically, a lot of, of our examples of successful GMO crops come not just from genes from bacteria, but the incorporation of genes from other plants that are just not sexually compatible with our crop of interest. And we've been doing this for about, this sort of technology has been in use for about 70 years. And this type of technology in terms of using embryo rescue to rescue wide crosses sort of gave rise to triticale as a new species. And I'll point out, sort of in preview of the lecture on Monday, uh, there were no regulatory control mechanisms in place to ensure that anything that you brought in from these wide crosses, and some of these things are pretty weedy plants, fairly toxic, contain a lot of toxins and allergens and a lot of undesirable stuff, but we had absolutely no regulatory mechanisms in place to determine that you made, when you made these types of wild crosses using embryo rescue or somaclonal or uh, somatic hybridization, that you didn't bring in something that introduced a new toxin or allergen. Also, through all of our mutation breeding, we never have had any regulatory process to determine that the products that we developed were really safe. So I'll make the point on Monday, it's only with plant genetic transformation that we really started worrying about the, the safety of the new plant products we were producing. This is just an example of protoplast fusion. You can either make a somatic hybrid, 
which basically takes the nucleus and the, the organelles from each of the parents and combines them. You can make what's called a cybrid, which is a cytoplasmic hybrid, where basically you can knock out the function of one of the nuclei, and so you can get one nuclear background with both types of organelles present in the original background, and if we did a little example of that in cytoplasmic male sterility, you can sort of transfer mitochondria that control male sterility into a restoring background or a non-restoring background very, very rapidly. You can do this either by using uh, polyethylene glycol, a chemical, or using this electrofusion technology which basically sends a little electric current through the plasma membrane and, and makes the membranes tend to adhere and the cells tend to fuse. All right, tissue culture and plant transformation. Um, genetic engineering, as we now refer to our plant transformation, as, this, as if we never were able to do any genetic engineering before, it requires regeneration of whole plants from single cells, and the efficient regeneration systems are a necessity for commercial success of transgenic plant cultures. But just to back up a step, when we go through conventional plant breeding using sexual crosses, we really go through three steps in the breeding process. We first generate or assemble new diversity we then select and test the superior recombinants out of that new creation, created diversity. Then we go through a process of testing, release, distribution, and commercialization of cultivars. Well, when you utilize the new genetic engineering or plant transformation technologies, you know, we sometimes can speed up the step of generating new diversity. But we haven't yet come up with a way to speed up this process of selection and testing of superior recombinants and release and distribution of new commercial cultivars. So often we're told that plant transformation technology allows us to very precisely add single or a few genes into our crop varieties much more rapidly than we could through conventional breeding. Well, if you forget about the last six steps of the process of conventional breeding, that's true. We'll have a slide at the end that shows really we get a lot more precision. We can add genes a lot less extraneous uh, genetic material, and we can accelerate this step very, very rapidly. But overall, the process isn't a lot faster. Major point is this transgenic technology is nothing but an extension of traditional plant breeding technology. It draws upon genetic variation across kingdoms and rather than species. The gene transfer is more precise in that a single gene is constructed and then inserted, but those genes are inserted randomly into a genome. And because of that, they could be expressed in a lot of different ways and to a lot of different degrees within different genomes. And the stability and level of expression have to be evaluated in regenerated plants in the field. And we'll talk Monday about uh, the concept of doing this in a commercial program to develop GMO crops. And you find out that 99% of the new constructs or transgenics are eliminated in about the second stage of testing because when you get to the field, the stability and level of expression of the gene just isn't there. And often, uh, unless you can transform a really elite variety and not change anything else in its genetic background, you're going to have to transfer those genes to elite varieties. And that's often a series of steps that are ignored when people say, well, we can transfer this into a crop very, very rapidly. 
So if, if you're looking at this from a molecular viewpoint, you say, okay, transgenic plant production, you isolate and clone a gene, you add initiator or other segments to enhance promoters, to enhance gene expression, you add selectable markers, you introduce the gene construct into a plant, you select the transformed cells and regenerate the whole plants. And suddenly we've got a new variety that contains a gene for Bt toxin production or herbicide tolerance. Uh, but you forget that then you have to cross that plant onto elite varieties and back cross. You got to test the level of expression and stability in each elite variety. And each construct could have different levels of expression and stability in different elite backgrounds. Have to look at the heritability of the trait in each of the varieties. You have to evaluate the performance of the transgenic variety compared to what's out there commercially grown. Then in addition to all that, you've got to get regulatory approval. And often regulatory approval takes several more years than all of this other process takes. So in realization, development of transgenic crops takes anywhere from a little bit to a few years longer than development through conventional breeding methodology. Albeit, with the transgenic technology, you can make some significant gains in productivity because of genes like herbicide tolerance and, and Bt toxins that uh, have very big effects. So rapidly through those steps, uh, identifying and cloning a gene of interest is the most limiting step in the transgenic process. Uh, there's a lot of effort going into identifying, characterizing, and cloning genes of agricultural importance. And so far, how many GMO crops have we developed that are agriculturally important? Or how many genes have we developed that are agriculturally important? can almost name them Roundup Ready, BT, two or three virus resistance. Anybody else have another one? Well, Roundup, there are other herbicides, but ironically, the other, the other major herbicide was not produced transgenically, it was produced through mutation selection and culture. So, it never had to go through regulatory approval. <laughs> strangely enough. So it's difficult to identify single genes that are important in agricultural production, um, which shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that knows and understands genetics, because we know there are a lot of single genes, but they don't control by themselves really important traits or characteristics. All right, so we talked last time or time before on end user traits that, you know, not only is it difficult to develop these nutrient enhanced factors in crops and get recover the value downstream, but technically it's very, very difficult to develop this. Now, golden rice may soon be approved through regulatory processes in India, maybe golden mustard might get there first. So we've got some other traits coming through. Golden rice required the addition of an entire pathway, several genes added, and involves about 75 different patents that were issued on the technology pertaining to how you go about developing golden rice. And so it may soon get out there commercially, but will golden rice really be accepted? And, and will it really be a commercially successful product? We don't know. I mean, maybe. We'll talk Monday about why BT and herbicide tolerance were successful and why they were accepted by farmers. And you can guess, what is the bottom line for farmers and why these traits are accepted? money. Return on my investment. 
All right, selectable markers. Why do we put selectable markers in? Because the process of gene transfer using either agrobacterium or gene gun is very inefficient. And you're good if you can get a 1 to 5% success rate. And so to select for a BT gene in a cultures, suspension cultures of maize or cotton cells is impossible to do because you can't do corn borer feeding trials on those cultures. So you can't select which of your cells were really transformed with the BT gene. So what do you do? You add a selectable marker. Well, I point this out because it's the selectable markers that, that uh, in a lot of cases caused a lot of the initial anti-GMO feedback. We selected antibiotics and said, okay, we can put a gene for antibiotic resistance in our gene construct right beside the BT gene, and then we select in our callus cultures or our suspension cultures for antibiotic resistance, and we know that the BT gene is linked to it. Well, a lot of people started to worry about, well, then that means our hogs and chickens and cows are going to eat stuff that carries antibiotic resistance genes. What if those antibiotic resistance genes somehow get out of the guts and into the microorganisms living in the guts and we create master races of E. coli that will come out of a pig lot, feed lot, and devour large parts of the earth. I mean, I mean, really it's scary science fiction scenario, but a lot of people were genuinely concerned. Well, with herbicide tolerance, we didn't have to do that because you could dump the herbicide into the selective media and you could select herbicide tolerance directly. And so we then started using herbicide tolerance or genes that produce visible markers and, and got rid of this antibiotic resistance. So that basically, I'll just rush through this, you, you put sort of the uh, ends of the gene, you put in selectable marker, you put in one or more genes that uh, you would like to select, and, and basically you build a construct that may have come, in this case, they're genes from daffodil rather than bacteria, but they look like a rice gene once you put all of these factors together so that when you bombard that gene into a rice plant and it inserts itself into the genome, the rice plant says, oh, I've got another gene here I can translate into proteins. Rather than, oh, I've got a daffodil gene and I don't understand what daffodil genes are doing. So, so basically, when we talk about a BT gene, the BT genes that were inserted in corn and cotton plants were no longer bacterial genes. They were genes that, co genes that coded for a protein in a bacteria that were reconstructed into plant genes. So you get the successful transgenic event, but they differ in the specific components incorporated and the place of insertion. Sometimes you get multiple copies of these constructs inserted. Sometimes you get copies and different copies inserted in different reds into the genome. So after the plants have been transformed, they must be evaluated. I'm sure you know either agrobacterium or biolistics of the gene gun, either way are good to, to get the genes in. Then you select first in, in culture and then regenerated plants and you have to select those plants to show that they uh, have the presence and activity of the genes. You look for other effects on the plant's growth and development. You evaluate environmental effects on the gene expression. Does it show up over lots of locations at a high level of efficacy? And you evaluate food and feed safety. Then once you have a transgene construct transferred to a crop variety, 
that expresses in that crop variety in all of these different environments and has no obvious detrimental effects, then you need to convert that gene into elite varieties. And that's where we run into to both the yield drag and the yield lag. Sometimes the point where that gene inserted into the plant's genome messes up the, the efficiency of that genome such that you never quite get the same yield potential out of that plant that you did before incorporating the gene. And so a lot of people will tell you in BT corn that it does not out yield normal, normal corn. Well, in, in most of the varieties that were converted and, and measured efficiently, yeah, without the presence of corn borers, it yields as well as normal corn. In the presence of corn borers, it yields significantly higher. The other thing that, that uh, you worry about is this yield lag. If it takes you four years to get that BT line into your elite variety, the competition has increased 6% in productivity over those four years. And so your new variety might be just as good as the variety you put it into that's four years old, but the four-year-old variety doesn't compete with the latest varieties out there. All right, so just to summarize with this timeline, and this looks at mutant isolation or transgenic gene discovery. Really, you can, for mutant isolation, you can translate a genetic cross to produce a new recombinant. One to two years often in this phase of development of the new genetic variation, whether you use transgenic or normal conventional methods. Uh, germplasm development, the first one or two generations of the conventional cross, or the testing of your genetic uh, uh, events, constructs, in various backgrounds, so that in essence, you maybe can, can take a few years or a few months off each of these categories if you're lucky with a transgenic event. But once you get to this stage, elite variety development, production of the seed that for seed production for farmers, initial sales of variety and large scale planting of variety, a transgenic variety will not go any faster than a conventionally developed variety. In fact, when you look at the uh, work and time for patent application and for patents to be issued, and you look for regulatory approvals and product application testing, if you're introducing new products into those varieties, um, this regulatory approval line can go well down beyond the three to five years. In a lot of countries in the world today, there is no way to get regulatory approval. And so even the successful GMO traits that are out today are not available commercially in a lot of countries because the lack of regulatory approval infrastructure. And of course, it's interesting, this phase right here, yield testing, is probably the major limiting factor in cutting the time to develop new successful varieties. And, and so uh, I encourage any of you that, that have interest in the molecular part, yeah, you can work up here and you can help us with better technology and better traits and more efficiency at moving specific traits into our crops. But boy, if you ever get interested in trying to find ways to predict or measure stability of yields over environments, in less than five years for a new variety, you could really speed the development of varieties in plant breeding programs worldwide. And ironically, there's a lot of technologies. Uh, when I started at Cargill, they basically said there's all these new technologies coming into plant breeding programs and we don't understand either of them 
the technologies that we're interested in are these biotechnologies, whatever that means, and these precision agriculture technologies are prescription farming or controlled application farming technologies. And actually, in the early years, we spent as much money working on GIS, GPS, and variable rate planning, monitoring yields across the fields, and all of this technology, which may ultimately have as much potential to really speed up the development of, of uh, crop varieties than the biotechnologies. But at any rate, I will uh, end with that for today.